Okay, so as Barbara just described, surveys of well owners show that testing rates are lower than we would like, and that the decision-making process around well testing is pretty complex. But we have to keep in mind that testing is just the first part in the process. Um, if testing reveals a health risk concern, then further action is required. So we are going to present the results of another survey study that we did at Minnesota Department of Health that used um, Barb's work as a, a foundation on what happens after the well owner receives notice of an arsenic problem in their well. <clears throat> so I'm going to give a little context about um, private wells and arsenic in Minnesota. Uh, I'll give a little background about the survey study. I'll present some of the, the survey results. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over to Frida to talk about conclusions and have a little back and forth discussion with you all because you have so much experience and expertise that we thought it would be a good opportunity um, to hear from you, um, to get your input on how we can translate the study findings into meaningful public health actions. So you better pay attention. So a little background, 20% um, of Minnesotans get their water from a private well. And since 1974, um, well drillers have been required to test a new well for bacteria and um, nitrate. But just starting in 2008, there's also been a requirement to test for arsenic and to send the, the lab report to both MDH and the well owner. So we know from these new well results that we have received since 2008 that 11% of new wells exceed the arsenic MCL of 10 parts per billion. So if ar when arsenic is detected, then Minnesota MDH sends a letter and an arsenic brochure to the well owner. And if the result is above 10 parts per billion, then MDH in the letter um, tells them they shouldn't be drinking the water over the long term and recommends that they take action and install treatment. So we're concerned about arsenic because, as you all know, it's a known human carcinogen, um, multiple cancers in um, a variety of tissues and organ systems. There's non-cancer effects. And we know that drinking water is an important route of exposure because arsenic is readily absorbed from the GI tract. So it's 70 to 90% bioavailable. So we want to know. Does this notification that we send out result in well users reducing their exposure? So we developed and sent out a survey with the following goal, to identify barriers to action and factors that influence a well user's decision to take protective action when necessary. Uh, and we wanted the, the survey results to be very actionable. We wanted to use them to improve our communications and outreach and to develop interventions that will increase protective actions among well users. So this is a very new survey. Uh, we just kind of uh, went through and number crunch and did the data analysis. The surveys were first sent out in fall of 2016. And we started off trying to think about, well, what should our sample size be? How many people should we send the survey out to? And then we decided, heck, let's send it out to everybody who's gotten a, a high arsenic result. So we sent it out to everybody. Um, <laughs> it was about 4,000 people. Once we did a little data cleaning, it turned out to be about 3,800 3, people um, that got this test result from 2008 through 2015. Uh, there were 31 questions, and these are often multi-part questions, um, similar to Barb's survey. So it was actually quite lengthy, but we really tried to limit it to um, having it take them only about 20 minutes. Uh, so um, we asked generally about the MDH communication materials they had received, what actions they took as a result of the arsenic level. We had some questions on just their general well-related knowledge, practices, and beliefs, and some of that overlaps with Barb's survey. And we asked about socio-demographic -demo factors. <sighs> this is embarrassing after Barb's talk, but we only got a 23% participation rate. 
<laughs> we know that incentives really boost participation. We did not offer incentives. There was no $2 bill in, or refrigerator magnet or anything nice in their packets. The other thing that really has been shown to increase participation is sort of um, continuous follow-up. Um, and we, we had one reminder postcard, but that was it. So for data analysis, uh, you know, we did a bunch of descriptive stats, just doing um, frequency tables, box plots, and then moved into some more, more formal statistical tests to look for differences between groups. So who responded? We ended up with about 800 participants. Um, you'll notice in this little pie chart of age that the youngest age group there was less than 50. Um, we did end up with a lot of older folks who participated. There were very few in the 18 to 29 age group, um, and also few in the 30 to 39. Uh, so we just ended up combining them all. When we looked at, um, at the, how they responded to questions, we did see similar patterns for these younger groups and some of the key responses. So they were generally combined for data analysis. 63% um, of respondents were male, and we did request that the person who was responsible for the safety and quality of the drinking water be the one to fill out the survey. So I don't know if that had anything to do with that. 58% uh, had a college degree or higher education. In Minnesota, there's kind of like a lake cabin culture uh, that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, so 86% of households were um, primary residences. Then there was, um, you know, the others were mainly seasonal vacation homes. Um, the results presented today are only for the primary residences that I will be showing you. Family income, we did have about a third of people in the highest income category. And in our survey, 55% reported that a child was present. And this was partially because um, the question asked about um, if there are children under the age of 18 that live in or frequently visit the home. So I think there were people that were responding for uh, grandchildren that were frequently visiting. So compared to the Minnesota census, and this has been found not only in Barb's study, but in other similar um, studies that uh, there was a higher percent of respondents that were male, um, were in an older age group, and in a higher education income group. And this is some unknown combined function of the subset of Minnesotans that live in homes with private wells, and also those who chose to take part in the survey. So first we asked a series of questions about whether they received um, the, the materials from MDH. Um, and there was a subset that did not. Um, so if they did not, they were ex they're excluded from the results that I'm going to show you for the next um, several slides. If they did receive our packet, then we asked how easy they found the materials to understand. And hardly anyone said that they found the materials difficult to understand. So I don't know if this is, they didn't want to admit they were difficult, but um, they were apparently easy to understand. And then we asked whether they were able to recall their arsenic result. And we didn't have them give us their specific result. We had them check one of these categories that you see up on the slide, um, with one of the categories being, I do not recall the level of arsenic in my well. So we found that 39% could not recall the arsenic level in the well. Um, the tests were conducted from 2008 to 2015. So we did see that there was better recall in the last few years, but there wasn't really a consistent trend there. And the thing that surprised us is that there was no difference in recall by the arsenic level. So we have everybody's test results, so we can you know, see who was you know, above 20, who was closer to 10, and we didn't see that the people that had the more concerning arsenic result, that, that there was better recall there. But we did see, as shown in the figure, that recall was lowest for the, the youngest age group. We're not sure why, since <laughs> intuitively you think your memory would get kind of worse with age. Um, so the other thing that we did was we looked at um, whether people were able to accurately recall their arsenic level. And we had the lab reports. So we found that an additional 20% under recalled their result, um, meaning they reported a lower level of arsenic than what we have on file. So some of that could be due to them remembering a later test if they had gone back and tested more. But that's sort of another concerning factor with not being able to recall the level and under recalling the level. So here's sort of a, 
<laughs> the bottom line here um, of this presentation, have you taken any of the following actions because of the arsenic level in your well? And we found that 35% reported that they did not take action. Um, people could choose more than one answer, that's why um, you know, there's, there's multiple selections allowed. 35% said they drink bottled water. 34% said they installed a treatment system for arsenic. Some of the other results were, I retested and the result was um, less than 10 on the next test. I bring in water for another, from another location, or I drink filtered water, citing a device that we know does not remove arsenic, like a pitcher water filter. So we wanted to look at if there were differences um, in who is installing treatment in Minnesota. So we looked at many factors. We looked at gender, age, education, income, whether the person grew up with a well during their childhood, the number of years they lived in the home, what their arsenic concentration was, um, if that was a factor, if there were children in the home. And we found that there was a, kind of a dramatic difference here between um, by income in that you know, those with lower incomes were significantly less likely to install treatment compared to those in the higher in, highest income category. We also found that education was a significant factor. Now this is interesting in that one of the predictors we found of installing treatment was knowing somebody who has tested. So we see a big difference in treatment between those who don't know anyone who has tested their well and those who know at least one person who has tested. And this sort of indicates that social norms really motivate human action. So people tend to follow the typical behavior of their social group. Um, and this is also correlated strongly with income and education. So the higher income education people were more likely to know somebody who has tested. Again, we see that social norms influence behavior. Those who agreed with the statement that some of their neighbors treat their well water were more likely to have installed treatment themselves. And this is a little hard to understand. The medians are the black bars. The gray are the mean numbers of years in the home for those that reported installing a treatment system and those that did not. And we see a shorter length of residence in the home on average among those who installed treatment systems. So length of residence has also been shown in other studies to be a predictor of testing behavior. And it could be that perceived vulnerability decreases over time as long as no health issues have cropped up. And this relationship was seen across all age categories, so this wasn't um, no, this wasn't due to age. So we were also interested in the reasons why people did not take action. So we asked them, if you've not taken any arsenic-related action, why not? And the most commonly reported result was that they were not concerned about the arsenic level. Now this could represent a lack of knowledge about health risks. But you have to remember that MDH already communicated to the well owner that the level of arsenic in their well is higher than the MCL. Um, and hardly any of the participants said the materials were difficult to understand. And yet we still see this lack of concern about arsenic. So we need to acknowledge that simply providing the information alone does not necessarily move people to action. So maybe our materials were comprehended, but were they effective? And that's a totally different question. Uh, we did see some other, we did see that 21% said they weren't sure what to do or who to contact, but even this was, you know, fell second to not being concerned. So we did have an other category for a lot of these questions, and, and they were actually very useful. We really got a lot of good information from them. Um, so here are some of the most common write-in responses for why they did not take action. Um, some people said that they retested and it was lowered in the retest. A lot of people said, well, the level used to be safe back when it was at 50 parts per billion, and I don't think there was ever any communication to well owners when the MCL dropped about what that means for them. Um, we got a surprising number of re write-in responsors saying that the well owner said the level's typical for the area, it's too low to be dangerous, the level would go down over time. 
a few about from the builders as well. Um, so we need, what we took away from this is that we need to make sure that the drillers, um, the home developers have the tools that they need to communicate about arsenic and drinking water because they may be the first and last source of advice that a resident may seek out about their well. So we asked them, how do they choose the treatment system for those that said they install treatment? And again, we see the biggest um, factor is that it was recommended by a well contractor or water treatment company. And if I had to do the survey again, I would break those two out. But we see again that private well users are looking to private companies for how to reduce exposure to contaminants, not government agencies. We were sort of in last place there with recommended by MDH or local government agency. So these results again highlight the importance of enlisting well contractors and water treatment contractors as public health partners and providing sound to advice to well owners about treatment options. So I'm running a little short of time, so I'm gonna to try to go through this quickly. Uh, we, just, we asked all participants, regardless of whether they had said they remembered reading the MDH materials, how often they drink well water. And we see that, um, we do see that people with treatment systems are drinking it more often than people that didn't say they installed treatment. But overall, we see that 83% of people on, pri on private wells are still, sometimes are always drinking the well water after getting this test result. So it really drives home that exposures to arsenic continue after a well is tested and a problem's been identified. So I'm gonna just skip, because I wanna leave some time for Frida. Um, we asked about bottled water use. Um, because we know that drinking bottled water is an acceptable protective action. That's perfectly acceptable. Um, and um, we found that um, the top choice, the top reasons were to reduce my exposure to arsenic or other contaminants. Women were um, significantly more likely to have selected that than men. Don't like the taste or smell of my well water. The younger age groups were more likely to be a little more picky about the aesthetics of their water. Um, treatment systems are too expensive. We saw um, significantly higher percent of people from the lower income groups um, reporting this. And we know over the long term, a treatment system is less expensive than drinking bottled water, but we know that the upfront cost, especially for point of entry devices, could be prohibitive for certain segments of the population. So sort of mirroring what Barb did, uh, we asked where they look for information to help manage the safety and quality of their well water. And these were the top choices. Um, we also included um, as possible choices, MDH, extension, water treatment company, friend, relative, neighbor, coworker, a health clinic, or a federal government website. And we see that these were the top choices for people. Um, so it, what it points out to us is that we need to have information available from a variety of outlets. We see that the older age groups and the lowest education income groups are most, were most likely to say a water testing lab. The younger age groups, not surprisingly, and the highest education income groups are, were most likely to say a general internet search. Local government website or office was not a top choice for any group, but it was a sec the second most common choice for the youngest age group and the highest income groups. So I didn't include MDH on that past slide because um, it was obviously a biased uh, question because we were the ones that sent out the survey. So even though interpretation of that survey result is problematic when we look at who said they would look to MDH, we can still see a trend showing that lower education income groups who are the ones least likely to install a treatment system are also the least likely to look to MDH for information. So lately, MDH has put a lot of effort into updating our well water quality information on our website, but there are really important differences in who is accessing that information. So um, since I'm just about out of time, I'm gonna, s what's that? Oh, okay, so I'll just finish this last slide. Um, so this, this survey focused on um, what happens after the water test is received, but we did ask some general questions about water testing. And 
so it's a little off topic, but it's important to mention that we saw these same socioeconomic differences in questions related to well testing. So um, we asked if they've tested their well outside of the tests that were done by the installer. And um, as Barb showed, testing rates were low overall, but still we see that there's a trend by, um, by education and income. We saw, this is an example for um, percent of the group that tested for bacteria, where you have this trend in higher testing in the higher education groups. And we also asked um, where, how they prefer to receive and return a test kit. And this is by income here. And if you look at the top bars, um, you see that the highest income groups were much more likely to want to just order the test kit on a website and return it by mail. If you look at the lowest bars, you see that those in the lowest income categories were much more likely to want to pick up a test kit from a local location and return this, the test kit to a local location. And although a small number of local government agencies have well testing programs, in general, the ability to pick up and drop off a test kit at a local location in Minnesota is very limited. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Frida to talk about conclusions and next steps and to lead a discussion. Great. Well, as we uh, set out at the beginning, as you know, we wanted to facilitate this survey to help us uh, take meaningful public health action. Again, we're looking to the survey to help guide us in how we can improve and strengthen our communications and outreach, and then also how we can better support private well users in adopting protective actions to protect their health. So you may have heard some of these themes come through as Deanna was presenting the survey results just now. And I apologize, I know that's a lot up there. I was hoping it'd kind of come one by one, but we're just gonna go, if you read through this chart, we're gonna talk about the conclusion that we've drawn from the survey. Those are the darker blue boxes. And then the lighter blue box next to, with the arrow at the end are some of the actions that we're discussing taking at the State Health Department. And just so you know, at the State Health Department, we do have a group of about eight people that work in a couple of different sections within the Environmental Health Division, who we've been working really hard on this survey, and now we're trying to use this information to figure out what exactly is our strategic plan for moving forward. Some of the conclusions that we really stood out to us include that arsenic exposure continues after well testing in many cases. So not only do we need to get people to test their wells, but also there's that action that needs to come after testing and determining if you need to do any follow-up action. So that really revolves around this concept of risk communications and how do we improve how we communicate. And you're gonna th see that theme coming up a few more times throughout these conclusions. And we're still thinking about that. Um, if you have ideas, we would love to hear. The second conclusion is that there are disparities in exposure to arsenic based on socioeconomically vulnerable groups. So as Deanna had pointed out, when you look at things based on education level, income level, you're gonna see different responses in what people do or what, where they expect to find information or where they would look to find information. So that's a flag for us as the State Health Department that we really do need to adjust our outreach approach, approaches to reduce those disparities and that it has to be different types of outreach that we're doing. A sim simple blanket approach is not gonna work to reach everybody out there. And then in order to do that, we really have to adopt a very customer-centered approach to outreach, recognizing that maybe if we're trying to reach people with lower education levels or lower income, we're gonna have to go farther, meet them where they're at. Maybe that's actually in their home, in their community, versus just putting something up on the web page. That we have to really think about that. Uh, the third conclusion is that well users trust local private companies and local government for information and guidance, and especially more than they trust the state government for that guidance, which really shouldn't be a surprise. But again, at this point, our web page is where a lot of our information is stored, and that doesn't go the distance. So we really have to be strategic in how we get that information out there and really form and strengthen those local partnerships and whether that's with local public health, but it sounds like even more importantly, partnering with water quality testing laboratories, and then the people who are also uh, the water quality treatment specialists as well, making sure that we're working in partnership. And also assuring that local partners have accurate information. And we've already started doing a little bit of that 
through our continuing education credits that we provide for uh, well contractors, making sure that they have accurate information about arsenic. And then just reminding people, if you do have questions, please contact the health department. Don't spread misinformation. Rather, if you're in doubt, contact us and we can handle the questions. And then that final conclusion that different age and socioeconomic groups look to different sources for information is just a really kind of underscores all these other things that we're talking about is that we have to have a very multi-pronged approach. We can't expect a single approach for outreach to work for every audience that we're trying to reach. And those audiences are also experiencing different levels of risk already. So we really have to be intentional to not widen that gap in terms of disparities, but rather shrink that gap. So those are some of the things that we've come up with at this point, but I know there are a lot more ideas out there. So this is where you get to participate. And we only have a couple minutes here. We have about five minutes left. I'm gonna ask if you can just turn to the people around you and think about what actions you would recommend or prioritize based off of these survey results. And to kind of make the parameters a little bit more tangible, I guess, Really think about that idea of how do we move people from just testing their water, but to also treating it or taking some protective action if necessary. So we're gonna take about two minutes. If you can just discuss with the people around you, feel free to jot down on ideas on these handy notebooks that are in front of you. And then maybe we'll share one or two ideas at the end of the two minutes and we'll have about a minute left for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Start discussing. Okay, I'm going to ask that we come back together. If you can finish up your sentence, please. Okay, the good news is we still have the rest of the conference, so I really encourage you to keep sharing these ideas with each other and if you feel inclined to also share them with us. But I would ask right now if there's one or two groups that wouldn't mind coming up to the mic and just share one of the ideas that you think would be a really high priority of something that you should do based on this information. Don't be shy. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm from Maine and I'm super psyched to see your survey results because we have, um, Columbia did some survey work in our neck of the woods which people have probably seen published more recently. So two things stand out to me. One, we have similar, almost exactly the same percentage of people that report switching to bottled water or treating for arsenic um, once they find out they have high arsenic. The other thing that we found that was the same is this idea of social norms and if your neighbor has tested, you're more likely to test. And one thing that I fantasize about all the time, and so I don't know if anybody else is doing this or has the resources to do it. I don't have the resources to do it right now. Um, is this idea of like an each one reach one type campaign. So if you're sending, and you guys seem really well positioned because you're, you're actually notifying people when their arsenic water is greater than 10, you could include a coupon for them to do a retest maybe in, a, you know, based on your guidelines for retesting and then give them a coupon for passing that on to their neighbor and say, hey, I just tested. This was great for my family because we now know what we're drinking. Why don't you take this coupon and get a test yourself? That's a great idea. Thank you. And I know we are at our 930 time, so thank you for volunteering and thank you for sharing your idea. Again, I encourage you throughout the conference, continue thinking about that question. And if you do have ideas, we would love to hear them. And or if you have questions, please come find us. We are happy to share any of the information. Before we go, we do have to acknowledge that uh, this study was made possible through the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment in Minnesota. Thank you, and here's our contact information.